Thank you for checking out Value Driven Life. I'm your host, Coach Chris McMahon, and today I am truly honored to be able to sit down and chat with Nick Sorrell. For those of you who don't know him, if you're not following him on social media, Nick is a creator, a consultant, and a coach. He spends most of his time finding creative ways to help bridge the gap between what they've been doing and what they like to be doing. Nick also has a dog. He says that part is very, very important. And I agree. I also have a dog too. Thank you so much for making some time in your day to be here, Nick. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're, you were actually brought to my attention. I think uh, Mike Dola, who's been on the show before, he, he reposted one of your things. And then Derek Stanley, who I'm friendly with, he reposted one of your things. And slowly but surely, I started to see more and more of your stuff. And I started following you. And it it's just a lot of what you do is you distill these bigger concepts down in a way that are like bite-sized and digestible. And you do it in such a way where you take these infographics or I, I can't even put them in that because they're not really infographics. Sure. They're like yeah. sketches almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And they just break down concepts in such a wonderful way. Uh, so Nick, how did, how did you get started with, with trying to go about it that way? Being, I, I know that's like, a, probably a big topic, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, so it 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 probably is a, a long story in the same way I think any kind of story like that is. But a, a relatively condensed version is I I started in the the fitness and nutrition industry, and I still I still do work in that industry. Um, but I also as I kind of got more of a footing, I started helping other coaches with their creative output, right? Whether it be their marketing, which is creative, or just literally like their creativity in general. Um, I've always been a creative person, which is kind of what led into that. People saw like that I could help. So they brought me on to help. And for a long time, helping others create stuff kind of scratched that itch, right? I would create stuff here or there. I would write. Um, and people gave me good feedback for my, for my writing, but I just never stuck with it because I was helping other people do it. I eventually got to a point, though, to where to kind of two things happened. I scratching that itch via someone else is still not the same thing right and because i do fancy myself a creative like that is an itch that like pretty often wants to be scratched you know um so i want to start scratching it for myself i want to start creating for myself but also a lot of the things that i would help other people with with their creativity um like a lot of kind of like the lessons or whatever i would teach in terms of like hey if you just stick with it like quality gets better as quality gets better has a better chance of popping off as you continue to get reps in all those reps are like lottery tickets and you're pretty much collecting lottery tickets to pop off and it all kind of like adds up but I, I got to the point where i'm like bro i should just fucking test this i should see if the shit actually works because one of two things is going to happen either it'll work for me I'll scratch that itch and then I can kind of point to my own situation as a case study or I'll realize it doesn't work and I can stop like saying the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like one of two things is going to happen. Um, my biggest friction point with creativity, though, is I. For a long time, didn't want to have restraints on the things I created. Right. So I, I wanted the freedom to create and the freedom to be open and so on and so forth. What happened, though, without me realizing it is whenever you can go too many directions, a lot of times you don't go anywhere at all. And I think that kind of applies mm -hmm. to many things in life. You know, you need certain restraints, whether it be creativity, nutrition, whatever you need some like guardrails. Um, so I decided to pick something that wasn't super hard for me, but was challenging enough that I had to like work at it to try to get better. Um, but that I could do consistently. So like when I first started creating the graphics, I, you know, chose a very, basic color scheme initially it was like uh i was alternating between black and white and then pink and white i guess is what it was um but then it was like i just don't like having to choose so i just went black and white that way i didn't have to think about it i had constraints um i tried to condense the um you know kind of the message into a graphic a visual um and i was very inspired by a guy named jack butcher and he runs an account called visualized value and i'm sure if anyone's familiar with that the 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 inspiration is very very obvious right when I first started creating, though, I tried too much to be like him in terms of just the graphic, not, no writing. And then I started to realize, like, oh, I should write because that's actually what I'm best at. I'm better at the writing as opposed to the graphics. And I think it's kind of that's why before we hopped on the call, you were referencing a graphic I'd made. And you're like, I don't even remember the graphic. I just remember the writing. And that's what I'm talking about. So I started adding the writing in, kind of differentiated in that way. And then things kind of started to pick up. So that's sort of 
how I fell into it. And it was really just me wanting to prove it to myself, to learn as I go, to scratch that itch. Like it was all these different things kind of all coming together in, you know, a nice way. Nick, that's such an interesting story because I think most people, that's how they end up falling into alignment with what is of most value to them, right? There's, there's some sort of itch, some sort of thing that they want to do, and maybe they're afraid to do. Like, I'm not saying you are afraid to do that, but there's this level of, of awareness that, okay, if this is the thing I actually want to do, and it actually doesn't go according to plan, then what does that mean about what I've been focused on? Like, yeah. there, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of that. And that's, that's part and why I wanted to bring you on the podcast, because you had this fantastic post. And I was able to search and find it actually, mm -hmm. uh, before we hopped on, but it was, yeah. it was called the journey dissected. And it's this wonderful graphic of, of basically like a loading bar, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it says the place where most people quit. And then a little further ahead, it's like the place where everything you've ever wanted lives. And if I was to summarize what you, what you said in this quite beautiful, I'm going to link to it in the show notes. Cause I think people are going to want to check it out. Um, and then folks will also want to follow you after they sure, read this yeah, one yeah. thing. Follow, <laughs> like, comment, you know, yeah, all that it, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it says that the greatest leaps of faith are often a little more than a single step that others refuse to take. That's mm. the difference. Yeah. A single step. Yeah. So this, this is, I, I think this in of itself is just so, so interesting because because I think a lot of people, if, if we look at like nutrition, if we look at weight loss, if we look at, if we look at anything that someone wants to do, it's always like, you know, you get the email from, I, I'll get the email from a client who's been working, let's say eight weeks and they say, all right, what can I do to make this go faster? Mm -hmm. Or what can I do to make sure I do X or Y quicker? And it's usually when we get lost in the idea of getting it quicker mm -hmm. that we see everything kind of fall off the rails yeah and that's usually what happens and since you're a coach and you're also you're doing all this creative work like do you find that that plays into this this like concept of like the single step the single leap yeah yeah so like you know re relating to nutrition and in particular that that sort of client message as, as an example of you know it's been eight weeks how do we do this faster you know like what do i do now and at that point, what you do is the last thing you want to do, which is keep doing exactly what you've been doing, right? So I think in any sort of journey, a lot of people get to this point and it's a lot of time, it's very subconscious and it's just like this kind of like curtain or cloud or something that settles in on us where it's like, oh, I am tempted to do this or I'm, I want to like pivot and do that or whatever. And we all hit that point. And the last thing we want to do is the thing that we started to do. And the reason we started to do is because we trust that it works. And that's usually where people don't take that single step. Like, so when that client's like, Hey, this is what you're going to do. Exactly what you did yesterday. That's what it is. You know what I'm saying? And I think we all hit that. And I think it can look a ton of different ways. It can be there. You can, you know, in, with nutrition, wanting the results to come faster. Um, it can also be like, you know, wanting to fall off the plan or to like kind of give in or get, you know, I think a lot of people get to that point where they get, frustrated by a lot of times the perceived lack of results i think a lot of times like the pacing of results is people people don't when it comes to like pacing of results this is like a quick aside i think a lot of times results happen slower than we wish but faster than we realize right so it's one of those things where if you told someone hey you can lose 20 pounds in six months they'd be like ah oh, that's 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 a long time but then six months pass and they're like fuck, I wish I would have started six months ago, you know? So it's one of those things where, it, I mean, six months ago was like the end of January. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy to me, you know? Um, but yeah, I think people get to this, thing, this, this one place where something wants to pull you a direction, right? And that's the point where most people don't take that single step. And it literally is a single step because once you do it, you sort of cross that very narrow, ch like narrow channel. You, like, you get better at doing that. You get better at feeling all because it's going to happen again. You're going to once again, a few weeks down the road, want to get pulled one way. And but now you you know that you can take that single step, that you can stay on the plan and you're better at it. And that doesn't necessarily make it easy, but it's sort of like it, it pulls off the blinders. You know, um, I think that's I think that's really it. It's just trying to catch yourself in those moments where you don't stay on the path. And you like you had mentioned like kind of a, a, a fear thing. I think, I think it sometimes can be fear. I think a lot of times it's just any uncomfortable feeling, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that, cause that's what it is. It's having to sit with 
the unknown or like anxiety or like there's something going on there's uncomfortable it wants to pull you off and you just got to kind of sit with it take that next step and then i think that's really what it is and i think that applies to literally fucking anything to be honest yeah nick that that is really quite true it's like this discomfort it's like we have a discomfort with discomfort like mm -hmm. we want we want life to be a bowl of uh, <laughs> my father-in-law says life is not a bowl of cherries i've never heard yeah. anyone say that before because uh, cherries have pits in them too so i yeah. mean there's yeah. <laughs> you know there's always going to be something yeah. that we can find this discomfort in and mm -hmm. it, in your mind how does one because you are a creative uh person and you are someone who's aware of all this how do we begin to ease into discomfort like begin to be okay with not technically being okay because yeah. Because, yeah, I would be I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think a lot of it and I, where my brain is going right now, I don't, I don't know if this is actually the answer, but it's where my brain is going. So I'm just going to follow it. I think a, a lot of the time when it comes to that being OK with not being OK thing. I think I think the big thing. That people need to do whenever they're going into a situation where they might not be OK or they're not OK or whatever is to sort of accept that that's what it is, right? So like, you know, with, with like fat loss clients, a lot of times like um, they would have like a scale fluctuation, you know, just they would go out to eat a day or two later, the, the water weight comes on. Um, and I used to like for a lot of times be like, oh, don't worry about it, it's just water weight. And like, don't even think about it, just ignore it. Um, don't let it bother you, that kind of stuff. And then I started to realize that like, I started to change my verbiage sometimes, obviously like it kind of depends on the situation, but I, I started to change my verbiage to something more like, Hey, the scale is going to go up. It's going to bother you and go into it knowing like, Hey, this bothers me. That's okay. Right. You know, like, cause that's the thing with a lot of this stuff is logically we know that it's like, okay. Right. Um, like we know that we're discouraged by this or we're like, we're upset by that or, or whatever. I think half the battle is knowing is knowing that you're going to feel that way. Right. Um, and then what I encourage a lot of people do is to do in those moments is like, okay, so you allow yourself to feel it. Right. But then try to just keep doing what you're doing and then see how you feel as you do it right just kind of experience it just kind of be awake see how you're feeling go through the motions or whatever um i think that's the biggest thing is like whenever we don't feel okay our first obviously our first like inclination or whatever is to try to make things okay or to try to do things we think will make us feel better feel good right that's why I like comfort foods and shit like that or you know taking the day off or log up you know whatever um that's what we do those things but they don't actually get rid of it you know they, they just distract us from the thing that's still there you know what i'm saying and, and if anything then later you feel guilty about having done those things and it just kind of makes things worse and it, it sort of spirals until people quit on what they're trying to do um so i think it really is just knowing hey i'm going to feel this way and i'm just gonna see how it feels i'm gonna try to explore that feeling yeah i think I think this whole idea of being able to explore the feeling, see how it feels, notice this, because there are two things that happen. One is you're probably going to feel that feeling again. Mm -hmm. You're going to yes. have that situation yeah. come up again. And if we are practicing something like some sort of coping mechanism that literally might not be the best coping mechanism, but it's all mm -hmm. we know, it's what we've done for the last 30 plus or minus years, we can't expect it to go away overnight. But what we'll start to find is, if we become aware of that feeling and be like, oh, I've experienced this before. Mm -hmm. I know that I can keep yes, going. I, I know, I know I have a new vocabulary around this, right? So yes. in Brene Brown's book, uh, Atlas of the Heart, you know, she talks all about how like most humans, of course, of these like 200 people they surveyed only know like three or four emotions. I might mm -hmm. be right, they, but, but there's the whole emotional wheel where there's like yeah. all these different shades to it, yes. right? And and that that clarity or being able to flesh out that, I feel like that opens up a whole different world. The, the point you just made about like, you're gonna feel that feeling again. I think that's the biggest thing is like, I, I say it to people all the time. I say, we're all good at the good days. The difference is getting good enough at the bad days or getting good at the bad days. I think that is like the key is like, because if you get good at handling yourself when you're upset or like frustrated or discouraged or whatever, 
those are all reps, right? And the same way you, you get a rep shooting a basketball or like swinging a golf club or whatever, um, each rep you get a little bit better. So uh, like a lot of times, when, especially when people like have a, like days where like they lose control or whatever, I, sometimes I'll, t and they really struggle with it. Sometimes I'll, t I'll tell people like, hey, I want you to look for forward to that day. It's going to suck. I hope it doesn't happen for a while, but we know it will, or we, we know it's going to. So whenever you feel that day, I want you to look back on this and be like, oh, this is that bad, bad day that Nick and I fucking talked about and or spoke about. And now I'm going to try to win it. You know, I'm going to try to get good enough at the bad day. And I think that's that's what it is, because we're like we're all good at the good days. Very few of us are, are any good at the bad days. We're most most of us are bad at the bad days. I think that is such a big piece. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Nick. I just want to highlight something that you said, like we'll have a conversation about what will probably happen when this happens again. Yes. And, yeah. you know, I think the thing that folks miss out on, if we're still going to stick in the world of nutrition, I mean, you can probably spread it anywhere you want, is people try to put a, con they, they try to control the variables. They try to, and, and when they can't, then they feel like a failure. And then mm -hmm. that failure kind of wraps into everything else. And we continue this, you know, yeah. either the diet cycle loop, we, we, we fall back onto this track. But the thing that that most people don't understand is like, no, it's not that you have to control when those things are going to happen. It's that you can control the actions you take mm -hmm. when those things happen. And yeah. when someone is aware of that, suddenly they become empowered. Sud mm -hmm. su suddenly their level of self-efficacy like increases. And yeah that's when we really start to see or you get to start to experience this level of like oh yeah. like i'm not i'm not broken yeah like, oh i i'm like i'm a thriving individual who just happens to be having like a a, a shitty day yeah like, what can i do here what what did nick tell me what what were some of the uh obstacle planning work that we did together like what yeah. were some of the right that's that's like the beautiful thing in this journey and Folks I think, try to erase that yeah, sometimes. I think the empowering part is super on point. I, and it's like a very subtle reframe, but it's, and you kind of mentioned the cycle too. Uh, most people operate in all or nothings. I think it's a default, especially if we're trying to progress, right? So like we said, that this stuff works with nutrition. I think kind of like that journey dissected post, I think any kind of progressive journey at all kind of, kind of follows the same framework. Um, and so we have like a plan and whenever we can't follow the plan, like you said, we feel like failures, we get discouraged, we throw on the towel and we kind of play this all or nothing type game. And the shift, I think a lot of times is trying to play all or something, right? So kind of like that, that like plan B thing. And the, I think the key to that is whenever like you're not having a day that's going your way, as you kind of said, controlling your actions, I, I try to tell people like, once again, like in any field, to try to treat it like a game, try to challenge yourself, be like, okay, so it, I'm not going to have an A plus type day. I don't know what the ceiling is. Maybe it's C plus, maybe it's B minus, whatever. Let me see how good I can be. Let me see what I can do and try to treat it like a game. Try, try to challenge yourself. Um, and I think a lot of times that shifts like, or kind of flips the, the feeling of life happening to you, to you happening to life kind of thing, or at least playing the game of life, you know, trying to get the best score you can that day. Um, I think it, it is such a, and whenever people really do it, it it's not it, like it's, it's empowering, but it's also like, I think in that moment, very fulfilling. People feel good, you know, it's like, so they feel powerful, motivated, but they feel good too. Yeah. Yeah. And gamifying things is quite interesting. I mean, it's why, you know, it's why things like, uh, like Weight Watchers or like Noom, like all of those things are popular because it it does gamify. Like there's mm -hmm. a point system. There's there's foods that are color coded. Like mm -hmm. all those things can, can be pretty disordered for for <laughs> folks if they try sure. it long enough. But that's what draws people into it. It's like, oh, I did this. I got a badge. Like yeah. I did this. I I, I I'm winning. Like mm -hmm. it's such an interesting thing, Nick. For me, hearing you speak about all of this, I wonder like what your starting point was in this journey because the folks have heard mine like but what was yours like how, how did you suddenly come into this realm of having this level of awareness or or understanding uh like just in terms of like what i know or like how i got into like my career like what it could it could really be like because everyone everyone kind of 
comes into their career. Yeah, I guess. It would, it, and I know you've had your 10,000 hours of coaching people, but I sure. mean, there's like this level where as a coach, at least what I've come to see is like, there's someone who coaches and then there's someone who, who empathizes while coaching. There's someone who, okay. cause you yeah. clearly have experienced this yourself before. Like that's oh, yeah, at least yeah. my, <laughs> that's yeah, how yeah, I yeah. interpret yeah, it, yeah, it's, you know? uh, it, it. That, that part's like a similar story is a lot like was overweight, played sports up high school, was overweight, graduated high school at 280 pounds. Met a girl I liked. She didn't like me. I lost 100 pounds. She still didn't like me, but I liked me. And then it all kind of spawned from there. Now, as far as like the like awareness thing or what or whatever, um, how I coach and how I create is very, very similar. I, I did a and a the other day and someone asked me like how I create or something like that. Um, but it, and the answer I gave, gave just now, I realized is exactly how I coach. And what I do is I sit down with a problem, whether it be an idea for, you know, a, a piece of content, it's like a, a solution, a lesson, whatever, or I'm doing a check-in or something like that with a, like a nutrition client. Um, I sit down, I see the problem, I see the solution. So I try to identify those two things. And then I, I try to put myself in the person's shoes, whether the person is a follower of mine on Instagram or a client, whether it be nutrition, you know, strategy, whatever. And I put myself in their shoes and I imagine going like going through that journey and kind of feeling what they're feeling. So like, and, and really trying to feel it the way I imagine, obviously there's, there's a disconnect there to some degree. I'm not them, but I try to imagine it the best I can from their shoes. Like, how does this feel? What is hard? What feels good? What can work? What, do, what doesn't work? So where the, it's where they're at, where they're trying to be. And I just run through that journey again and again and again in my head. And once I get a good feeling for like what kind of causes light bulbs to go out, what makes sense, what kind of like words I think that they'll, they'll resonate with, I run it one more time and I hit record. And mm. that's that becomes the check in that becomes the Instagram post, whatever. A lot of it really is like I'm going to the best of my ability, put myself in your shoes and try to feel, try to experience what you're going through, through, through your eyes. And I think that's the big thing. I think sometimes we, mm. and we all do this, right. As coaches, creators, whatever, we assume people know what we know sometimes. Like, for example, like I am the worst like navigator on like a road trip, right. Or like even on a short like trip, like when I'm in the passenger seat, I'm terrible at giving directions. Cause I assume if I know where to go, people do too. And if that's not how it works. Right. But yeah, I, I just kind of put myself in the person's shoes and just really go through that journey. So like a lot of times when I'm coaching or, or what or, or writing or, or any of that stuff, like I guess I, I run it more, one more time and hit record. When I run it one more time, I'm once again, nothing's planned. Like the check in, nothing's planned. I'm going through it one more time, hitting record. And what that journey ends up being is like what gets written, what gets said or, or whatever. So, and I know that's like very abstract, but that genuinely is the process that I go through. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it doesn't sound that abstract because I, I grew up and all I wanted to do was be an actor. That's oh, all, that's all yeah. I wanted to do, Nick. And I went to school for it and I did it. I, I was I acting. Can see it. I, I can it, see it a little I, bit in you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah. I did it. And, but I fell into fitness because I was doing it as my day job. So I didn't have to go be a waiter somewhere. That was sure. the, that, you know, that old trope. Yeah. And what I found is in the realm of acting, you know, you have the folks who are method actors who like live it, breathe it, uh, mm. do whatever that character would do. And then you have the other people who just practice the art of listening. Like that's, mm. it's a listen and response, you know, much like this conversation is I'm just listening. To, there's no script here. I, I don't yeah. do that because it's not genuine. And to me, it sounds like that's what you're almost doing. You're putting yourself in that scenario and, and thinking about those feelings and what it might be like in your life. And maybe there were moments in your life you felt that way. Mm. And the reason why I bring this up is because I, I personally find this, you know, when I work with clients and stuff, it is e emotionally draining because you yeah. have that level of awareness. And on top of that, you know, I, I do the podcast, I write weekly articles, I write email and you, that I do creative things and I make mm. 
multiple pieces of content every day for social media. And you're doing that too at an even, in my mind, it seems like this <laughs> higher level than I can even imagine because you're also helping other creative people and you're also coaching other people. So Nick, for you, like, how do you even begin to recharge? How do you even be, be able to put yourself in airplane mode? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, man. Um, I'm not very good at it, to be honest. Um, because the, the thing that's so hard is like, for me, and maybe, maybe, maybe you'll resonate with this is all that stuff is draining and exhausting. And it's weird. Coaching sometimes can be coaching in particular, sometimes can be wildly fulfilling. And sometimes like, like, like sometimes it's like fucking miserable to be on like some like it's just like some days I like I'll start and like you know how like at the end of the at end of like a very busy work day you're like drained right and everything feels heavy you feel like you're walking through mud there are days that I'll start the day and I feel that you know and it's like oh uh, shit you know um and and what's tough is when it comes to like creating and kind of running through those journeys like all that stuff I just kind of ran through is like I like that stuff like is fun for me like i find that very very fun very enjoyable in the same way like i like thinking and being curious and like wandering mentally um so it's tough because like whenever i do go to unplug or whatever and try to recharge it the thing i like the thing i have fun doing is that so it's it's, it's tricky for me in that way sometimes um for me like i luckily i have like a, a a puppy named august and he uh he and i go on like two walks a day and that helps me and i'll put on a podcast or or whatever and i just kind of that helps me like kind of really walking is like really does charge me up like you get into like obviously you're like being aerobic and stuff like that and and the, the benefits there it's very like meditative i think in a way um and it and and I, I hadn't really thought about this till just now, but I think like having the podcast or something I'm interested in gets me sort of like out of my head and, and into someone else's sort of, and lets me kind of like go along for a journey as opposed to being the driver myself. So that's very helpful. But then I also do like, like I, I, I like, I know everybody likes this, but like, like TV series, movies and stuff like that. Like I genuinely like good stories. Um, so I like, but I have, but I have to be careful there. Cause I also, so I, I have ADHD and like, if I'm really into something, bro, I will sit there and watch, like, I'll be up till 4am watching like some bullshit or something. You know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> I do have to be careful. It is something I'm not, I think, okay. So I know I'm just rambling. I, I think for me, the, the best thing I do do, cause I'm still not very good at this when it comes to recharging is when I, whenever I am feeling drained, I try to be very wary of things I know will drain me further. So it's less about recharging and more about just trying to like cut off access to mm. stuff I know is going to like crush me, but that, that I also know that I'm going to want to be crushed by it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, yeah, like, yeah. so that's, that's probably the one thing I do do well when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. It sounds like you're proficient at setting boundaries for, for uh, like, uh, for the lack yeah, of, for, yeah. for survival. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, while I think you thought you were rambling, you really weren't rambling. You were, you were highlighting like a lot of points that I think people also genuinely go through, whether yeah. that be in weight loss, whether that be in just existing as a human being. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like we find the thing we love, right? And then we begin to identify as that thing that we love. I am yeah. a creative individual. So if yeah. I'm not being creative, then what am I doing? Like mm -hmm. that, you know, that it becomes that I am the person who, who lost, lost 100 pounds. If I'm suddenly not being hyper aware of what I'm doing that allowed me to do that, am I no longer someone who is bringing this sort of value into the world, whether that yeah. be uh, discipline, whether you value, uh, awareness, whether you value community, right? There are so many different mm -hmm. layers that go into this and it come, it becomes a conversation of like, okay, what am I valuing in this moment? Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that's a really big thing, Nick. And I think um, the, yeah. the, the identity thing is su super interesting. I like my, so my first job in fitness was doing strength conditioning for the U university of Louisville football, football team. So like a division one strength conditioning job, 
was my first job. Didn't have a degree, just got lucky, fell into it. It was just the weirdest thing, right? So I did that for two or three years. The head coach eventually leaves, goes to Texas. Um, his name is Charlie Strong. When the head coach leaves, the strength staff, all the support staff go, goes with him typically. Um, and because I was hired, but bottom of the totem pole, I was going to have to like be unpaid for the first six months. If I went there, I couldn't do it. So I, I went private sector or I became a personal trainer. Um, but yeah, whenever that first, whenever I first shifted out of it, there was like an identity crisis, right? Of like, fuck, I thought I was like the football strength and conditioning coach. And now I'm just some dude telling, and this is sounds terrible, but I'm just some dude telling middle-aged women to like stretch or like whatever, you know, um, which obviously is di disordered thinking, but it's because that kind of identity thing. There's another time in, uh, it's like my last year of college, I, I was dating a girl. She and I broke up. I got very emotional, ate way too much food on campus. Papa John stayed open until like 3 a.m. It's a problem. Um, ate way too much food. And I was very emotional. And because I knew I was in fitness, I was like, fuck, I'm the personal trainer who can't control himself. And now I'm going to gain all this weight and all this other stuff. And I, so I actually struggled with an eating disorder for like two years after that. So I had like chronic bulimia. And a lot of it was just born that that disorder was just born out of that, of that identity, like putting this pressure on me. And those are two like, you know, bigger examples. But like, I think a lot of the time we, a lot of disorder, a lot of struggle or whatever comes with like a lot of like identifying with something, you know what I'm saying? And then also there's like the self-fulfilling prophecy of the thing we are. So like, like I said, like I have ADHD, I probably had, I, I, I mean, I assume I've had it my whole life. I didn't know it until I was like 29, right? Like I didn't never had like the words for it. Um, and I was listening to a podcast with Andrew Huberman the other day um, about, about it. I thought it was interesting. And uh, he's talking about like things kids have nowadays. So like kids, for example, have like rubber bands on their desk. They can just kind of play with and snap and shit like that all day. And I, it made me wonder, I'm like, I wonder if I knew I had this my entire life if I would have adopted pieces of it that I didn't actually have kind of like, you know, with any kind of disorder, you know, or whatever, like, or sickness or whatever, there's like a laundry list of symptoms, but you never have all of them. Like with COVID, for example, some people would have one, some people have the other, some people wouldn't feel anything at all. Um, and I, I, I always like, it made me wonder like, fuck, would I have like started to think I was certain ways and adopted them, even though they weren't, those weren't symptoms I had, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that I, this is way off topic. I think that identity, identity thing is so, so interesting. Yeah, Nick, I don't think it's, again, I don't think it's off topic. I know, sure. I know yeah, you, cool. you say that sometimes, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's really not because yeah, look, I, I am someone who struggle struggles with alcoholism. I, sure. but the moment I, you know, and I've been sober now for a while, but congrats, dude. Yeah, you know, when, awesome. thank you. Thank you. But when, when you're in the room and you hear other people talk about their own journey, suddenly you compare your journey to their journey and you're not really supposed to do that. Yeah. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to say, oh, wow. Well, they're, they're, you know, they're way worse than I was. I never mm -hmm. did that. And anyone yeah. who's in that sort of room will be like, will probably go through the same thing. And it's the same idea. It's like, I could choose to identify as someone who has an addiction problem, or I can choose to identify as someone who holds a value around family, around strength, around um, of uh, curiosity, like these things that I, I, that's why I'm so drawn to value work, especially with clients, because those are things that I can actually work toward or shape toward. If I yeah. choose to identify as one singular thing, I'm actually doing myself a disservice because mm. I miss all of the other colors and sounds and music yeah. that can be that can be present there. And I know everyone has their own journey. And I really appreciate you feeling comfortable enough to share parts of your journey here. Sure. Yeah. But I want I want you to know that it's really, really important that you shared that because other people hear that and they go, oh. I'm allowed to identify as someone who's interested in X or Y. I don't have to necessarily identify as the person who's had this. Yeah. I've been, I, you know, I, I'm type one diabetic. I have been since I was 10. I've been alive longer with it than I have without it at this point. And 
I don't identify as someone who's who's diabetic. Like that's right. not what I identify as, right? Yeah. So it's it's the same thing in a way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. With uh the so you mentioned so I can't even remember exactly how you worded it, but with whenever you went through the alcoholism, you don't mind me asking, yeah. did was there an element of like you had an idea of what alcoholism was that was more extreme than maybe what you were experiencing and that was your litmus test for like oh no that's what alcoholism is not this yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. i grew yeah i grew up my father my father is an alcoholic and i grew up where he would you know be gone for for days at a time getting mm -hmm. incredibly drunk and being sometimes one of the most cruel people and other times one of the most lethargic, lazy people, like mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. And I viewed it as, well, if I'm not doing that, then I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, when I was in college, there was never me having one beer. I can't have one, which is, yeah. I. but I was like, but I would go weeks without having it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, there's not, I'm not like that. But suddenly it became more apparent to me when I was, I couldn't go to a party or be around other people without needing to drink. Mm. I I needed that security blanket. I yeah. needed I needed that to relax my anxiety and my depression and my you know probably as I've gone through it now and even hearing other people talk about probably some sort of attention disorder. It's sure. usually creative yeah. people have that and yeah. I I'm, I'm not diagnosed at all but I think there's a lot of that present in that. So for me, the reality came when it started to affect my relationship with my, my wife. We were, you know, that, that when I started to see it affect other people or see my emotions only be able to be regulated by doing X or Y, mm -hmm. that's when it suddenly became, Oh, and I, I, you know, that, that gave me like having to compare to someone else, like even even now, like I mentioned, being in rooms and 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 talking about it, it's like, oh, yeah, you can't classify someone else as it. You can classify yourself as it, but you have to be aware that like usually if it yeah. barks like a dog and it sounds like a dog, yeah. and it smells like a dog. It's a dog, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's so interesting. And once you get this, like real I, I always so i've done a handful of podcasts and i always enjoy the podcast where i realize things that i hadn't thought about you know on the podcast you know or before it or whatever um so like with you the values is what got you out of it um that's kind of what happened to me with like bulimia too i remember what got me out of it was i eventually had this moment of like thinking to myself I'm like like what if like what does my look what does my life look like if i never stop you know what I'm saying? Like what happens then? And not good things, <laughs> you know? Um, so like, that was kind of the moment where I was like, Oh fuck. If, if like, cause it got to the point where it was, it was very bad. Right. Um, and very consistent. It wasn't like it would happen every now and then it would happen like two or three times a day type stuff for like a few months. Um, and it made me realize like, Oh, I'm not going to like be healthy. I'm not going to like be productive. I'm not going to like achieve these things. I'm not going to like be functional. I'm going to have this like, Thing that you're ashamed of you know um right or wrong you know that was what and because it went against all those values right all these things i did want to do um that's what snapped me out of it went cold turkey and hadn't done it since right um and this is like i said like like a, a little while ago you know um so yeah I, i'd never realized it but it was the the inflection point of turning the corner really was kind of a, a value-based thing i'd never noticed that actually so it's very yeah. interesting yeah i i really can appreciate you sharing that and you know that's one of the i don't i hate to use the word tricks but for anyone in recovery anyone who's trying to get through it i'll be honest like i white knuckled it you're mm -hmm. not really supposed to do that sure uh, yeah because here here there's a term for it uh it's called a dry drunk which is basically you don't have your security blanket anymore so your emotions run all over the place. Mm. And for me, I, I food is not a vice for me. For me, exercise became my vice. 
So it very mm. quickly became where I was working out like twice a day, long, hard sessions. I, I, I needed to do X or Y. And it, so it, it went from one to another, which is that's what happens with an addictive personality. Yeah. And the thing that actually shifted it for me, and I don't know if you've noticed this in yourself, is when I found a community, right? So that's what the, the room is. It's a community for mm -hmm. folks. When I found therapy, when I was able to talk to someone else, when I found these two things suddenly became much easier to actually articulate how I was feeling versus saying, I'm just angry. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just an angry person. Like, yeah. these people are wrong. Like, it, it became, oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm actually feeling frustrated because I don't want to feel this feeling like it's like, yeah, it, yeah, it oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. did you, do you, did you find that for yourself or was it like, you know, that's, I'm just, that's, I'm just done with this altogether. That's what I was, I was just, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking of, and asking because I was, because like I said, like I'd never realized the value thing until you said it. So I was going back. I'm like, I wonder if that did happen. I didn't ever notice it. I don't think it was like a community thing, although it's like, it's hard to say because that did coincide with me pivoting to like you know kind of like quote unquote like working online and stuff like that when it, and as you know like whenever you work online you especially in the fitness industry it's pretty it's relatively small really um at least people do it full time you know mostly quote unquote the right way uh, so it, it did coincide with that so i did kind of step into a, a new social circle which was cool because i had like my social cir social circle at home with all of the friends I grew up with. And then all of a sudden I had another social circle of all these people online that I, I didn't necessarily work with, but a lot of them became like, like very close friends. Like earlier you mentioned Mike Dola, he and I are very good friends, Derek Stanley, he and I are very good friends. Um, and I would imagine you and I have a bunch of mutual friends actually. Um, but a lot of these guys have become like my best friends. So it did coincide with that. I don't, I don't know if they were related. I, I do know that that's whenever I started to really start to share creative stuff online. I wasn't consistent then, but I did have outlets then. I had I actually wrote an article about bulimia that went like quote unquote like viral on Reddit at the time. Um, so like I don't I don't I don't know. Like I, I'm not really sure how to answer that to be honest. I think. I think in hearing you talk about it, you, you do have some form of community. Like it may For not sure. feel that way, but you know, the internet can still be your community. You know, mm -hmm. it, <laughs> it sounds so weird saying that, you know, my son is, is two, two years old, a little mm -hmm. older than that. And for him, his world is going to be so different from what <laughs> you yeah. or I grew up with. Yeah. You know, he will most likely, you know, my wife is a teacher. She says all the kids bring their Chromebooks to class and mm -hmm. there's no writing anymore. And it's very much this. He's going to grow up in a world where it's a level deeper yeah. than that, where yeah. where everything, <laughs> everything literally is like he'll probably have like 10 best friends who live in other countries because because they'll be probably. online together. Yeah. So it's how, like, how old are you? I am 32. OK, I'm 31. So we're right, like right around the same yeah. age. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we I think our age is weird because like we were like for the most part, like the last kids to get to experience any of the time before. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because really yeah. and we didn't even get a lot of that. A lot of that was hitting like when we were in high school and stuff like that. Um, like I think like yeah, like in high school. So it's like we're like this weird transitional type generation, you know what I'm saying? Which is so interesting. Cause yeah, the kids now like it's like but what's cool is like in kids now, you probably see this in your son, like they're a lot of them are just so like, I don't, I don't know if creative is the right word. So obviously some people, some people are, but they're like, just, just like doing stuff that I would have never imagined doing at like their age. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's wild. Yeah, like there's a know. kid, uh, real quick aside, like he followed me on Instagram. His name's, uh, his name's Jay. I wish I could remember his Instagram handle. He, he does stuff kind of like I do um he's very smart he follows a lot of smart people he's only 16 and he's like a big fan of mine and i i like him too um and i just like there's been multiple times where i'm like fuck dude i wish i had started doing this shit when i was 16. imagine how much further ahead you, you know what i'm saying it's crazy yeah and you know it's interesting because 
I was recording with the guest, uh, folks listening, it'll come out in a couple months, but they said that during the podcast too. They said, I wish I knew what you know when I was at 10 years into my career. And I was mm -hmm. like, I think you'll always be able to say that no matter, yeah. no matter what I wish I knew. It's not that people are learning at different speeds. It's the information is available. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to when you and I technically probably started around, like I, I started coaching folks like, er, er, like 2012, like early 2012, where I, I was doing it before that. And I wasn't getting paid because I was in college. And then yeah. I, and then I got a job doing it and still had no idea what I was doing, but to get the information, like T nation was popular. Like there were, yeah. there wasn't a lot like precision nutrition was like the only nutrition thing I knew of. And like, even then it was like a huge textbook. There was no online portal. There wasn't, yeah. I, I couldn't just go on my phone. I, I had a smartphone, but it wasn't like that fast, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then I think about the group of people like 2008 and 2006 and 2005. And it's like, the rate at which the information comes out, the rate at which research comes out now, like we've mm. hit this point where nutritional information, it's about five to six years, they'll do a study and then it comes out. And so all this information is coming out right now. Well, guess what? For the next five to six years, nothing new is going to come out because mm -hmm. there's all this other information and we can just go through it at such a fast rate. So it's like, that's a good point, actually. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Everyone's yeah, faster. learning faster now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is the that's that's the way like technology works, rather. Right? There's all kinds of like crazy stats I've heard and little facts that I wish I could remember a single one, but like like you know, like the 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 time between like invention A and invention B was like 10 times as long between invention B and uh, and invention C and shit like that. Like like stuff just happened so fast and there's like this sort of like accel like acceleration that happens and it, it's it is wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. So, Nick, if if folks wanted to work with you, I know I I know you know Mike. So, I if you're at Stronger Year, you're doing stuff there. Or are you are you coaching on your own? Are you what do you, what? How can yeah. folks get in contact? So, with you yeah. So the out? easiest way to get in contact with me is just to follow me on Instagram. My handle is just my name. So at Nick Sorrell, S O R R E L L. Um, if you're looking for creative help, just message me. I do my nutrition coaching through Stronger You with Mike, um, and I can direct them there and, and help them out with that. Um, so that's the easiest way to get in contact with me. Ah, awesome. So Nick, the last question I ask every guest and. I, I'm interested to hear your answer. If you can go hop back in time, you can choose the DeLorean, you could choose uh, the Avengers method of going yeah. <laughs> back in time, whatever. Uh, if you could go back to when you were first getting started in this whole thing, which is probably around the time I was getting started. Sounds like uh, it. What is one piece of advice that you would give yourself? Not necessarily to change anything, just so you could have a level of awareness. What do you think it might be? So throughout my life really i have gotten lucky like a lot of times like not powerball winning lucky but i've just gotten lucky so many times like i said my first career was a or my first job in fitness was a job i shouldn't have had first you know and there, there's been so many moments like that and i eventually did get to a, a place where i had the realization of like what if you get this lucky break because i had just gotten one and and the thing is, is I've had all these lucky breaks, but I've just like taken advantage of a lot of them or wasted them and, and stuff like that. And I had like the thought, like, like, what if this is the last lucky break you have the last one ever you've had a bunch of them, but this is the last one and you waste this one too. And you never have another one. How much would you hate yourself? Like talking to myself, like at the end of your life, like, fuck, you had all these breaks, you wasted them all. You never got another. I think I would go back and tell myself something to the tune of like, hey, don't waste these opportunities. Like take advantage because that is, and, and maybe it's applicable to some people listening, but I know that for me, that is the one thing that I wish I would have like learned sooner and everything's been, it's worked out, but I would, that would be the one thing like, hey, you're going to get all these opportunities. Don't waste them, take advantage of them, make them mean something. I think that's the advice I would give myself. Uh, I think that that's an awesome piece of advice and anyone can apply it regardless is we only get so many opportunities, even if we don't view them as opportunities, but we only get 
so many. So yeah. why not lean in and take advantage of that? I, yeah. I think I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to be here, Nick. And this is going to be a great conversation to folks to listen to, whether they are looking to lose weight, starting their fitness journey, trying to figure out different things in life. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Madhu. Yeah, it was uh, it was one of those like conversations that was very selfishly like uh, it was very fulfilling. It made me feel good. So I thank you for that. Uh, yes, yes, it's my pleasure. And if folks, if you're checking this episode out because you're fans of Nick, I really appreciate you being here. Do me a favor, drop a five star review on Apple Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you manage to hear this episode. It helps other folks be able to hear it. So I hope. You all go have a great day and do amazing things because you can.